Hello, I'm Drew Pickens, and in this video, we are going to be introducing the idea of the buying clock. And the buying clock is a metaphor for describing the process of making a purchase in a buyer's mind. If you think about the hours on the face of a clock, it, the hand sweeps those hours as it goes through time. Well, the, the buyer's mind does the same thing. It goes through a series of steps as it contemplates whether to make a decision and uh, whom to make that decision with and implementation and the, and the likelihood of making the decision and so forth. And so this starts with the conception of the idea of making a purchase through to the selection, through the negotiation, and even to the implementation. So the buying clock uh, can go forward, it can go backwards, it can stall, it can sit on a certain hour for basically forever. Uh, the salesperson can kickstart the buying clock and get it going. The salesperson can rewind it. An outside force can also stall it or rewind it or get it going forward. So the, you're, we're going to explore the idea of the buying clock here in this video. And uh, to best understand where to enter the clock in a buyer's mind so that you as a salesperson have a greater likelihood of success and matching up with helping a customer be successful in their buying process and understand the good and bad of each place along the buying clock and where good to enter and where bad to enter. Maybe this helps to explain a little bit of what you're running into as a salesperson. So let's look at it. The buying clock begins with the idea that a buyer starts to review a decision they may have made in the past. And this can apply to anything. We're gonna use the example of maybe buying a car for today. So a, you know, most of us that have a car, at some point we start to review the decision that we made when we bought that car. Was it the right car? Was it big enough? Was it reliable enough? Did it get good enough gas mileage? Did it fit my garage? And all those things we start to review um, this decision we made. We may love it, and if we love that car and it was a great decision, then we'll hold on to it for a long time. But if there are areas to improve, if there are things that we didn't like or things that could be done better, then the, then the clock starts to move. And it goes to this first step at one o'clock where we start to identify areas for improvement. We start to think about what could be better in my car. Uh, could it be larger? Could it have more seats? Could it, uh, you know, uh, be better looking? Could it be more reliable? Could it get better gas mileage? All of these things are areas that could be improved over the decision that I made and over what I'm currently using. And if there are enough areas for improvement, the clock continues to sweep and it goes to two o'clock. Well, we start to evaluate options. You know, what's possible? Uh, are there cars with enough seats to fit my large family? Are there cars um, that look and feel the way I like, that'll fit in my garage? Is there something that gets better gas mileage because I have a long commute? Um, are there cars that are a better color? You know, all these types of things go into our, our options, right? What, what options, what's possible out there based on where, how I can improve? And if there are enough things out there that look like, hey, there is a possibility to improve and, it's, and there are the options are available to me, I start to define the criteria. I start to whittle that down to say, well, I need X, Y, and Z, I need it to be this price, I need it to be this color, um, all of the things that uh, go into defining my criteria for making a purchase. And every buyer does this for everything, not just a car, but for a house, for groceries, for gasoline, for any purchase they make, clothing, anything at all, they go through this, these, these steps on the buying clock in their mind. Now, the things they buy very often, like gasoline and clothing, the clock's going to move very fast, right? Because they already know what they want. They already know the criteria. It's already defined. The options already exist. But for the more complex purchase, the clock moves a little bit slower. And they may sit and deliberate at 1, 2, and 3 o'clock for a very long time in their mind. But assuming they get through this, assuming they get to 3 o'clock and they have criteria defined, they will then what we call go out for bid. This is when the, the, uh, the buyer sees what's possible. You know, what is out there now that meets my criteria? So back to our car buying example. This may, might be where they, they browse the internet for local car dealers to see what is in stock, uh, to see you know, how much the, this car, you know, the car that they, they, their criteria defines, how much does it really cost? Uh, what's on sale out there? Uh, who's got what to offer right now? I might go look at used cars. Um, there's all kinds of things that go out for bid can represent. But if the buyer goes out into the marketplace and sees who's out there that meets their criteria, and whoever is out there that meets their criteria, then becomes a proposal. They start to look at the proposals. Well, you know, these dealers have this car for this price. These other dealers have this car for this price. Um, these, these dealers have the color that I want. These dealers, but they have a better price, right? They start to review all those proposals. They start to see what's possible. And based on that, they whittle it down to a few finalists, right? And we see this in our business world all the time. 
right? If a, if a customer goes out for bid to see, you know, who can come back and do business with me, uh, they will review those proposals and whittle it down to a couple finalists that they want to look at a little more closely. And those finalists then will probably enter up, end up entering a negotiation process where there's some type of negotiation that goes on and there's an outcome from that negotiation, right? A final price or a final package is arrived at. And when that final negotiation comes to a conclusion, there's a signed agreement. This is where the, the winner of all of this process ends up earning the business. So back to our car example, this is going into the finance office and doing the paperwork. You know, it's, it's signing the contract, it's doing the finance paperwork, it's signing the agreement. And after the agreement's signed, what happens? Implementation. This is where we drive the car off the lot or uh, in the business world, this might be technology getting installed for a customer, this might be setting up accounts, this might be putting pricing in place. It's doing all the implementation things that require a purchaser to actually begin using a product or service. And once implementation is done, where do we end up at? Hopefully a status quo, where the product is in place, they're using the service, we are at a, a stable state now where the buyer enjoys the benefits of the product they purchased, and if we're a good salesperson and we're fortunate, the customer that we just sold to will stay in a status quo state for a very long time. But what happens when any kind of a serious purchase is made? Well, the buyer starts to receive feedback. The buyer starts to get feedback from their colleagues, you know, in the home example, maybe from a spouse or children or anyone who's involved in that purchase. And that feedback causes the buyer to begin to review the decision. And if there's enough feedback, and the results of the reviewing decision were significant enough, what happens? The clock starts all over again, and we might end up down here buying another car somewhere in the future, and then that car is at status quo, and we enjoy that car, and we get feedback for that, and it happens all over again. So you can see where the buying clock uh, can stay in one place for a long time. It also represents all the steps that a buyer makes, and so as a salesperson, we wanna ask ourselves a question. Where do we usually enter the buying clock for our customers or for the customers in our marketplace? And I would submit to you that most salespeople enter their customers' buying clocks at four, five, and six o'clock. And this is not a great place to enter because the buyer has already defined their criteria by this point. You are now reacting. If you don't have something that satisfies that criteria, then you're not gonna be successful. You have a very low likelihood of being successful. If you can enter the buying clock somewhere between 10 and 1 o'clock, you have a much better chance of success. We're going to show some evidence of that here in just a second. But this is where advertising comes in, right? This is where trying to plant ideas in buyers' heads comes in. If you can get them thinking about something that they were thinking about before, begin to review their decision, begin to think about how, how things can be improved, then I'm shaping their ability to evaluate options, shaping the criteria that they define. And when they get down to four, five, and six o'clock, I have a much greater likelihood of being successful in making the sale to that buyer. So that's why we want to engage them very early in the buying clock. And here's some evidence of that. There was some research done a few years ago that looked at buyers in general. And it said there are people out there currently looking for a solution. These are the people that are out for bid right now, or they're really actively looking for changing something in a purchasing environment. And then there are people or companies who are just stagnant. They are at status quo They are, or, or review, receive feedback. They are just enjoying or paying the, the price of a purchase they made long ago. And we're gonna say on general, this is probably about a 20 to 80% split. You know, 80% of companies are, are status quo, receiving feedback, 20% are, are actively looking to change something and do something different. And so the question is, if we can create um, opportunities for this 80% out there that are at status quo and get the buying clock going, what is the likelihood that I'll be successful? And research has shown that the win rate when responding to the 20% that's looking is probably only about 30%, where the win rate on that 80% that is at status quo is more than double, but I have to get the clock going. If I can get the clock moving on that 80%, I have a much higher likelihood of success, more than double the likelihood. So it's about engaging customers who aren't looking and putting ideas in their head, bringing insights, getting them to think about things they weren't thinking about, think about opportunities for improvement, helping them define criteria, help them to evaluate options, and you'll be there when they go out for bid and you'll more than likely be much more successful. So remember, the buying 
clock is about describing the process in a buyer's mind. It's about helping them to conceive of ideas. You're with them through the selection, the negotiation, the implementation phase. Uh, you can cause the buying clock to go back to reconsider things earlier. So if a customer reaches out to you at four o'clock to go out for bid, rewind the clock, have a conversation about their criteria and about what they're trying to improve and, and, and what kind of feedback they're receiving. That's rewinding the clock and have a more meaningful conversation so that you can help them shape that criteria more finely. And then lastly, understand the consequences of entering late, of just responding to bids and how it's much better to help customers shape criteria and understand how they can improve. So understand the buying clock in your customers' minds, be with them on that journey, and you'll find much, a much greater likelihood of successful sales down the road. So good luck managing your customers' buying clock.